So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this first uh, session uh, of the conference on the relation between monetary policy decision making and, and financial markets. So I'm uh, Iman Ramoni Rousseau. I'm the Director General for Market Operations at the ECB. Um, and, and this first paper that uh, uh, Mark Bauer will present is, is really uh, looking at an alternative explanation for the Fed information effect. So this is a paper that you know deliberately adopts, uh, I think, a myth-busting approach uh, and gets into the crux of a question that we, as financial market professionals, uh, ask ourselves routinely: with is, you know, what is exactly the information content of central bank decisions? Yeah, and does the central bank know more uh, than the market, or is it just reacting differently than expected to the same set of information? And in other words, should we read um, into a Fed decision or any other central bank more than it says? And I'm delighted um, to have with me uh, Michael Bauer, one of the authors, to present the paper. So Michael, you are a professor of uh, financial economics at the University of Hamburg since 2020, but you started your career uh, after your PhD from the University of California, San Diego, as a central banker, yeah? And uh, you were senior economist and research advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco for about 10 years. Your research focuses on the interactions of financial markets with the macroeconomy and monetary policy, and your work has been published in leading uh, economic journals, including the American Economic Review, the Review of Financial Studies, and the Journal of Business and economic statistics. Michael, the floor is yours for presenting your paper. You have 30 minutes, and this would be followed by a 10 minutes of Q&A uh, with the audience on the chat. Okay, Michael, the floor you. is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Tough lead to follow here. It was such a great presentation by Ken Rogoff. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my slides here. I think uh, you all should be seeing that and hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, okay. This is work with Eric Swanson. We both used to be at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco for a number of years. And the motivation here is really coming from, uh, you know, our experience at a central bank where we were kind of doubtful of this story uh, of central bank information effects that there is so much superior private information at the central bank about the economy. Uh, certainly, uh, we as forecasters were looking at the private sector just as, uh, as much as maybe the private sector was looking to the Fed. We were looking at the forecast and thought, you know, there's highly resourced and experienced and experts um, looking at the same data that we are looking at. And so we were uh, skeptical of the story that the Fed is uh, superior in its uh, knowledge and forecast of the economy. And, and so we dug into the data to kind of uh, uh, see whether this uh, evidence on these information effects is really uh, as solid as it seemed. And, and we found that it is actually not. Uh, so we came up with an alternative explanation for this evidence. Okay, but it's all, all about uh, these monetary policy surprises that are widely used in empirical macroeconomics. So those are essentially rate changes around FOMC announcements or ECB announcements. Think about you know money market futures rates, take a handful of them with maturities of a several months to several quarters, um, and the 30 minute changes around the announcements. And then people usually take maybe the first principal component of these rate changes to summarize what's going on. And now the usual assumption is that these are predetermined uh, and unpredictable. Um, so, so then you can use them because they're econometrically exogenous to estimate the causal effects of monetary policy. For example, on financial markets, uh, and a number of papers have done that. And more recently, people have even used this to estimate the impact on the macroeconomy using things like uh, structural VARs with external instruments um, and so forth. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so let me just uh, make sure my uh, volume is, uh, is uh, high enough here. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> now there is this really puzzling recent evidence that um, that the response of macroeconomic survey forecasts seems to go in the wrong direction um, when, uh, so for example, a tightening surprise, so an increase in these futures rates around an announcement would, according to standard New Keynesian theory, lead to a negative response of output, employment, and inflation. And so you'd think that survey forecasters would um, revise down their, uh, their outlook for these variables in response to a tightening surprise. But what a number of papers have actually shown is that the uh, survey forecasts um, respond positively to the monetary policy surprises. Um, maybe most prominently, a paper by Nakamura and Steinson in the QJE uh, has uh, shown that real GDP growth forecasts respond positively to these monetary policy surprises. There is some related evidence about the stock market uh, that I may or may not have time to talk about. Um, but uh, a, an explanation for the evidence, for the puzzling evidence from surveys, as well as for the evidence on the stock market, is a, a Fed information effect. Okay, so what does that mean? That really means that kind of um, independent of the actual policy action and its impact on the economy, the central bank conveys private information about the economy. and directly affects beliefs about the economic outlook with its announcement. Okay, so as an example, if you have a tightening surprise, so interest rates jumping up as a response of the announcement of the central bank, then uh, this might be seen as good news for the economy because it could be seen as signaling a more optimistic outlook of the Fed, the central bank. Um, and so forecasters and investors might then revise up their outlook, uh, taking that signal on board from the central bank. Now, if these information effects are really strong, uh, then that has really dramatic implications for both empirical macro, but, but also the practice of monetary policy. I mean, just, to sketch them, you know, you cannot use policy surprises, these rate changes anymore to estimate the causal effect of policy, uh, monetary policy on the economy because you have these confounding information effects and they would be uh, really hard to, um, to account for because by their nature, they are unobserved. And for the practice of monetary policy, and you certainly see concerns like this uh, in policy discussions, for example, in the minutes of the FOMC meetings, um, in practice, it might mean that surprises may have counter, uh, counterproductive effects. Uh, and so policymakers might be less inclined to surprise financial markets um, than in the absence of such information effects. All right. So, we uh, propose an alternative explanation in our paper of this evidence um, based on what we term a Fed response to news channel. Now, what this means is that, um, well, of course, survey forecasts and monetary policy actions both respond to macroeconomic data and macroeconomic news. Um, but if the monetary policy surprises are also systematically related to the state of the economy, then you have a problem in these regressions and kind of the basic underlying assumption of a lot of empirical work using these surprises is violated. Uh, you cannot, you basically have an omitted variable and we'll show that that matters a lot. 
So our evidence is, first of all, going directly back to the survey regressions and showing that economic news is an omitted variable uh, and accounting for it changes the results dramatically. We also did our own survey of professional forecasters. We went to the blue chip uh, panel and, and, and asked these forecasters how they respond to monetary policy. And our results suggest that they respond in a very conventional way and that there's almost no evidence at all uh, for the possibility of information effects uh, from, the, from the forecasters themselves. We, we revisited some of the financial market evidence and, and we don't see any convincing evidence there that there's systematic information effects. Um, and we also revisited some of these forecast accuracy uh, comparisons. Is the Fed really a better forecaster than the private sector? It does not seem like it. So overall, we find no evidence for information effects in FOMC announcements. And we have a story for why monetary policy surprises may be systematically related to macro news that is based on incomplete information about the monetary policy rule um, but that is kind of not crucial for uh, the main points I'm, I'm trying to make here. Okay, so let's look at this survey evidence. Okay, so this is the regression that Nakamura and Steinson ran. Revisions in forecasts for GDP growth are regressed on their monetary policy surprise. They just use the first principal component of changes in these futures rates around the announcement. Okay, so under the assumption that this policy surprise is exogenous, this would estimate the causal impact on the forecasts, um, and standard theory implies that the impact should be negative. And, and puzzlingly, they estimate positively and significantly positive uh, coefficients. Okay, so we're going to revisit this here in our sample. We updated the data. We looked at different surprises, different macro variables. And overall, we also find this puzzling sign. Like GDP growth and, and inflation respond positively to a tightening surprise. In the upper panel, we use this nakamura Steinson surprise, so the first principal component of futures rate changes around the announcement. In the bottom panel, we used the more commonly used target and path factors um, that were proposed by Gerkeinach, Sack, and Swanson in 2005. Um, and for the unemployment rate, it's the other way around. Okay, so there is something there, but it is really not very strong. Uh, there's some warning flags here. This, these results are often insignificant. They, they change a lot over different subsamples. And their statistical relationship is very weak. The R squares are sometimes round to zero or generally between you know one and five percent. And so this is very noisy. Um, but still, uh, overall, there seems to be something there that uh, we need to look at a little bit more closely. Um, by the way, we, of course, replicated Nakamura Steinson's results and looked at, at different samples and, and investigated how this changed with the sample choice. Okay, so our story is that there are uh, economic news that are affecting both the FOMC action and the survey forecasters, right? So um, you have a good employment report. The surveys are respondents are going to revise up their outlook. Uh, in this example, and the Fed is, of course, generally going to respond by increasing the policy rate on the margin if there are good news. Now, if it responds systematically more than expected, so if there is a systematic hawkish monetary policy surprise uh, when there's good economic news, then you have a problem with these re uh, survey regressions because then you have an omitted uh, variable bias. Okay? So, the usual regression is uh, the, the uh, I, I showed before, um, but there's also these economic news, an omitted variable. Now you have a bias uh, from your econometrics 101 class if the news are correlated both with the dependent variables, so the survey forecasts, um, which of course they are, 
right? There's no question about it. We have extensive evidence of this also in this paper, but it's really not surprising. And I'm going to skip that evidence here in the interest of time that, you know, economic news, economic data affect the survey forecast. So beta is, of course, not zero. Um, but the more puzzling issue here is um, you also need the news, the data, the macro data to be correlated with the policy surprise systematically. Now, the usual assumption is that this policy surprise is not correlated with data timed before the announcement. And here this, I'm a little sloppy with, with the notation here, but these news are all measured before the announcement, uh, before announcement T. So known at the time of the announcement and the policy surprise is uh, the, the change in rates around uh, announcement T. And so uh, we find uh, uh, that gamma is also not zero. So let me show you that. And then I'll include these uh, news into the baseline regression and, and show you that there's a big bias in theta. Okay, so um, the, um, this is the data in Nakamura Science and then already kind of tells the story. Uh, there are um, big positive, uh, uh, you know, revisions to the outlook in the upper right that were also, um, that also uh, saw uh, big hawkish policy surprises. So there's systematically hawkish surprises when the economy is doing very well in the late 90s, 2003, 2004. And on the other side of this, these most influential uh, observations in the lower left were times when the economy was doing very poorly. So of course, the outlook kept being revised down and the forecasters, that's not surprising. But what is surprising is that there were systematically large dovish or easing surprises. Um, now, there seems to be this omitted variable here, the state of the economy, the, the, whether there's good or bad news about the economy that explains this positive correlation and not uh, a causal effect from the announcement surprise to the macro forecasts. Now, remember, that is the story that several papers are telling. There's a causation from the monetary policy announcement to the macro forecast. And we're saying, look at this picture, there's an omitted variable that affects both of these. Okay, so this is the one I'm gonna skip, right? And, and then here is the uh, slide with, I apologize, a little too many numbers, um, where we regress the policy surprise on a bunch of macroeconomic news and financial indicators. All right, so three different regressions for three different kinds of policy surprises, the target and path factors, and the nakamura Sanson surprise. And without going through each of these individual predictors, um, just gonna summarize this evidence as saying, these policy surprises are, so are predictable with information before the announcement, the uh, predictability is very strong. In some other samples, it goes up to 40% R squared. This is in line with some evidence that, that uh, the next presenter, Anna Sieslak, uh, published in a 2018 RFS paper. We kind of revisit this, uh, uh, look at a few more predictors, uh, find a little bit stronger uh, evidence, but, but very much in line with, with Anna's finding. Uh, findings. Um, now, but what we conclude here is that there is a problem with the basic survey regressions. We have to control for these macro news. We took these financial indicators, by the way, because they really nicely summarize all kinds of news that we couldn't possibly all put into a regression. The first one, for example, is the change in the S&P 500, um, you know, the log. So it's a return over the roughly the quarter leading up to the day before the FOMC announcement. So that, um, if that is a positive return, that is usually a time when there's a lot of good news. And that then systematically and strongly predicts a hawkish policy surprise, which is, is puzzling from, a, you know, kind of like a standard theory perspective. Okay, so this is, the key result on the survey regressions. 
the top panel just reiterates the basic uh, results of the, the univariate regressions um, or, well, the regressions without any controls. So you have these kind of puzzling coefficients that sometimes are significant, not a very strong relationship though. But if you include these controls, then all, essentially all of the coefficients flip signs, the magnitudes are equally large, if not larger than before, and often uh, strongly significant. Um, the R squared, of course, is very large because of the controls that we include. So you estimate these also much more precisely, the effects of, of monetary policy surprises. So here, the upshot is if you control for the state of the economy, for the economic news, then monetary policy surprises um, have a totally conventional impact on macroeconomic forecasts, okay? So we think that this is a better estimate of the causal effect of monetary policy on macro forecasts um, and that it suggests that information effects, while we can't rule them out completely, uh, are not strong enough to make these coefficients zero or even have the puzzling opposite sign than, than conventional theory would predict. And the coefficients here, I'm not going to go through like the units and, and the sizes and the quantities, but, but they're generally in line with what you'd find from standard textbook um, monetary uh, economics uh, models and estimates of the effects of monetary policy on the macroeconomy. Okay. Now, why are monetary policy surprises predictable? Um, we really think it's because of learning about the policy rule. We don't think it's a risk premium story. Risk premiums are really too small um, in, in these near-term futures. Um, it's not crucial for our story, but, but we think that, uh, uh, that uh, it's incomplete information about the policy rule. There's some supportive evidence. Um, Anna has some evidence in her paper, a recent working paper by Mike Schmeling and co-authors also suggests that the market underestimate, underestimated the Fed's responsiveness to macro data, systematically underestimated, which is exactly what we need to explain our results. Okay. But I'm gonna leave it at this, uh, you know, uh, this does have really strong implications though for applied work. Like you cannot use monetary policy surprises as an exogenous instrument if they're correlated with the state of the economy. Okay, so, in, uh, so you need to account for that, for example, by taking either controlling for the news as, as we're doing here or by projecting out the news and just taking the residual of the monetary policy surprise so this is important for, for this literature. Okay, so I wanna say a few words about our own little survey. The nice thing about financial data is that you can really isolate the effects of the FOMC. That's why there's a lot of papers using event studies, um, Kuttner, Gerkinex X. Swanson, Bernanke and Kuttner, many more. Because you can be pretty sure that you have a causal impact there. But surveys are kind of annoying. They are monthly, quarterly. We wish we had daily surveys. Um, this, our solution to this problem uh, of low frequency surveys is uh, to ask the forecasters uh, directly about how the FOMC announcements affect their forecasts. We tracked down the chief economists of the entire blue chip panel and sent them our short questionnaire. How do you revise your macro forecast in response to these different components of the FOMC's policy action? We also asked them about the, how they revise in response to the SEP forecasts. Um, I didn't include that here, but it's just shocking. They, they never respond to the SEP forecasts, which is, really a problem for the information effect story because that says the Fed has better forecasts or better knowledge or at least somehow useful knowledge, somehow not a perfectly correlated signal. Um, so people should take it on board, but they don't. Uh, at least that's what they tell us. Okay, but back to the policy action. Um, 
what if there's a hawker surprise in either the target rate or the statement or the dot plot? Uh, forecasters either don't revise their forecast or they revise it downward, which is the standard direction for a hawker surprise. Everything here is mirror image for a dovish surprise, and everything is parallel for the other macro variables. A handful said that the direction depends on other factors, um, but uh, that would be the only forecasters that, could, that you might count in the camp of sometimes potentially some information effects. Uh, even with this general uh, generous counting, you'd have uh, 31 to 5 against information effects from, from our survey. Now, remember, this is exactly the survey forecasters that um, are delivering the data that are used in, you know, the regressions uh, that are uh, the information effect regressions, if you will. So we think this, uh, this really undermines that, those kinds of regressions. Okay, so I think I may have two or three minutes to talk about financial market evidence. Um, so <clears throat> this is a table with the 10 most influential observations in the nakamura steinson regressions. Right? So these are the, um, the ones in the upper right and the lower left of my scatter plot. Oh, these, these really drive, like sorted by their effect on the T statistic, if you include them versus exclude them. Right? So um, of course, you know, the so policy surprise in the third column and the a GDP forecast revision in the fourth column have the same sign. These are the most influential observations. Now, what did the stock market do around these observations? It essentially always went in the standard direction of a tightening surprise causing lower stock prices and vice versa. Okay, there's only one uh, exception uh, here in March 2001. And similarly for exchange rates, exchange rates also went in kind of the standard textbook direction of a tightening surprise um, appreciating the dollar. Right, so this kind of high frequency evidence suggests that these announcements did not actually contain strong information effects um, if you look at the tight window and that Instead, what caused this positive correlation between this policy surprise and the macro forecast was the state of the economy, summarized here in the last column with this Brave Butters Kelly macro indicator from the Chicago Fed, where negative value shows the economy is in bad state and vice uh, is in a bad is in bad shape and vice versa. Okay, but that was basically our story for explaining the, the survey response. Okay. Now, um, let me just say that when we regress this, you know, let me put it this way. Information effect story does not say the stock market response necessarily has to have the opposite sign. It says because of how stock markets work and discount rate news and cash flow news, it's just, it just says there should be a weaker response if information effects are there. Okay, so maybe they are just weaker, although still of the conventional sign. Now, what we did here is we kind of split the sample into the most influential observations. So presumably, they would have big information effects and show a weaker stock market response, but that is not the case. It's at least as strong, if not stronger, than for the other observations in the sample. Okay. All right, so let me conclude um, let me just uh, conclude here. Okay. So we think that overall we see quite extensive evidence against information effects in FOMC announcements. Okay, so we haven't looked at ECB announcements. We also haven't looked at other policymaker speeches like chair, chairman speeches, chairwoman speeches. Um, the, um, you know, CZAC and Shrimp find some more information effects there. So, so maybe there's something there, but certainly around FOMC announcements, there doesn't seem to be any convincing evidence for information effects. The standard survey regressions have a big problem. They um, uh, have an omitted variable bias. And if you count for uh, 
these omitted variables, then you resolve the puzzle that has been documented in several papers. And additional evidence, I talked about our survey, I've talked about financial markets, and I just want to emphasize again that the Fed is not a better forecaster than the professional forecasters. If you look at the blue chip uh, forecasts, for example, and so that is also uh, of undermining this story of a better informed Fed. Now, we find that the policy surprises are exposed. Now, this is a, not a real time out of sample forecasting exercise. It's just a correlation in the sample. But exposed, they're correlated with uh, economic news. Uh, and this correlation is consistent with the market underestimating the responsiveness of the Fed. Um, for macroeconomics, this means, for empirical work in macroeconomics, this means that monetary policy surprises should not be treated as exogenous. Ideally, you would want to project out macro news. Um, Eric Swanson and I are working on a follow-up paper that uh, we hope to present at the at the NBR Macro Annual next year, um, where we do this um, this analysis. Um, so, revisiting local projections or structural VR estimates of the effects of monetary policy, it's important to account for this channel that we document here in this paper. And I talked about the implications for monetary policy communication. Um, it's it's uh, not. Uh, a concern from our evidence, at least, that surprises would have counterproductive effects because of um, revealing information effects. So we think that's that's a first order issue for monetary policy communication. That is all I have at this point. Thank you very much.